welcome to the webinar series on fascinating facets of yoga this is a webinar series we are conducting in commemoration of the azadi ki amrit mahotsav and also the celebration of the international day of yoga today we have a very eminent person with us dr bindu putti from the nimhans she is a professor in the department of neurophysiology and also in charge professor and coordinator of nimhan center for consciousness studies she is a very active researcher in the field of consciousness brain plasticity and uh, sleep architecture dreaming meditation cognitive science and uh, to name a very few so she has a very very active research record and very interesting research on cognition sleep and consciousness and today we are really fortunate to have her with us and we look forward to her interesting talk so with this few word, words over to you ma'am thank you varun bhai i i am uh, audible no yes ma'am and can i stop the video or my video yes ma'am sure so thank you so much dr brumai and my thanks are due to you as well as your organizing team uh, for um, initiating this webinar very interesting title fascinating facets of the multifaceted yoga as a part of both uh, asadika amrit mahotsav as well as um, um, international yoga day that is coming uh, in this month Uh, and the topic given to me is very interesting. That can technology help or support the inner exploration of mind and consciousness? Very interesting and very challenging topic. Um, so uh, I'll try to do some justice uh, to this topic. And um, uh, in my talk, what I have decided is that in the first half of my talk, I will be talking about the initial research studies that have been carried out since nineteen twenty five. and um, uh, up to 1990s or 2000 then uh, with the newer technologies how a paradigm shift has happened that helped us uh, to understand the brain and mind in a, a better perspective and that knowledge how that helped in understanding mind and consciousness from the neuroscience perspective so uh, that is the topic i mean uh, that is the way i have structured my talk so as you all know that yoga has been uh, practiced uh, in ancient india or thousands of years ago uh, as a best technique or as a mean to achieve the best possible uh, mind body uh, harmony so that means mind body harmony is very important it is a, it is of paramount importance that help us to lead a life worth living like uh, we, because we can achieve many virtues through this life and this has been expounded in more, almost all religious texts across religion uh, but uh, i would quote here about the bhagavad gita a uh, bhagavad gita says that or expounds that this uh, mind body harmony helps in achieving virtues like solemn bearing that is earnest behavior unbroken joy benign meditation deep discrimination and uh, such attitude helps in spiritual upliftment of humanity so such an important aspect such an important uh, uh, technique uh, we have in our hand and that helps in achieving the best uh, possible uh, harmony between body and mind and uh, uh, we are also uh, we can also be very proud of ourselves that that is one of the india's contribution to the world that we have provided this knowledge of yoga to the world and uh, also we can be proud that the international yoga day is uh, being celebrated worldwide across the uh, i mean across the country or across the world um, since 2014 so that is uh, very uh, i mean appreciable and uh, that also highlight the importance of yoga uh, in our life and now coming to the scientific uh, um, um, enquiries regarding yoga it is swami kuvelananda 
um, he is um, from Kaivalya Dhamma uh, near Pune. It is he who has pioneered this uh, research studies on yoga. And his research studies have been um, uh, I mean, uh, published uh, since 1925 uh, in Yoga Mimamsa, actually. So you see that uh, it is an Indian who has uh, initiated the scientific studies on yoga. That is also very um, applaudable. And uh, yoga became more acceptable to modern world through these scientific studies, actually, because his studies has um, encouraged many scientists to undertake various uh, aspects of uh, various uh, aspects of our biological system and how yoga has an influence on this. Like the science of yoga has begun thus by 1925, and these these scientific um, uh, enquiries that uh, uh, that helped the modern world to understand more about yoga. And initial studies uh, were mainly uh, to understand the science of yoga, especially on our various body functions, like uh, on our cardiovascular function, on respiration, on body temperature, on metabolism, and so on. And uh, studies have, these studies have shown that uh, yogic practices help to establish a wake, wakeful hypometabolic physiological state. So this is very important. Wakeful hypometabolic physiological state means in this state there is a uh, there is a proper autonomic modulation uh, takes place that enhances the parasympathetic function, reduces sympathetic activity, and it enhances uh, it you know like uh, regulate your sleep, uh, enhance your immune function, hormone regulation, and so on. So you see that uh, yoga practices uh, help to uh, achieve a wakeful hypometabolic state. And uh, so when you say hypermetabolic state, there is decreased metabolism, decreased uh, blood pressure, decreased the rate of breathing, and uh, decreased uh, body temperature, reduced or regulated activity of the hypothalamus of the pituitary axis. And thus, uh, in this deep, so you will be enjoying a deep relaxation and uh, associated this deep relaxation is accompanied with a feeling of uh, peace and contentment. So you see that just yoga brings an equanimity, a mental equanimity. That is what yoga, I mean, Samattam Yoga Uchide means this only. This is what uh, um, uh, is proclaimed through this uh, particular sentence, Samattam Yoga Uchide. That is, you are establishing a mental equanimity by regulating most of the uh, your body functions. For example, cardiovascular function, we just you record the ECG. From the ECG, we can regulate, we can uh, study the heart rate variability. In this heart rate variability, uh, we are measuring mainly even the fluctuations in respiration and the state of mind. Even so, if you are in a stressful state of mind, this RR interval will be occurring very frequently. Uh, whereas, if the RR interval is of a, a particular uh, um, time frequency, see for example, 859, like or more than that, you know, you can say that this is an indication of a predominant parasympathetic activity. And when we say parasympathetic activity is predominant, it, that, uh, that, uh, that is an indication that it has uh, helped in establishing a hypermetabolic wakeful state. And uh, your, regular, your uh, uh, respiratory uh, uh, pattern or other uh, metabolic activities have been taken care of. Whereas in, when there is an enhancement of sympathetic activity, it enhances, it accelerates all the metabolic activity, body temperature will be enhanced, the HP axis will be highly active. So um, sympathetic activity is also very important, but sympathetic activity is associated with the flight and fight mode. Whereas when you are in a, when you are leading a normal restful life, you need to have an enhanced parasympathetic activity that establishes a, a very powerful um, hypermetabolic state or a very deep relaxation state. And that is very much important for proper normal body functioning and as well as establishing um, uh, quality like, like wellness, wellness and uh, uh, enhanced quality life. So many studies have shown that uh, meditation practices um, helps to establish a proper, I mean, or has an influence on HRV and also uh, helps to establish this um, uh, hypermetabolic state and also enhances immune system 
and um, various. So you see that uh, yoga, and when you do yoga, yoga has uh, influence on almost all body functions. And that helps uh, to bring an equanimity, a mental equanimity, and a highly restful, relaxed state of mind. And this is one uh, study, I just wanted to uh, uh, give an example of how yoga enhances uh, various uh, uh, hormone levels. This is one example we have uh, studied. This is from our lab study that uh, uh, mindfulness meditation. This is mainly on mindfulness meditation practitioners, especially senior practitioner, practitioners of mindfulness meditation show enhanced melatonin levels. So these are the enhanced melatonin levels when compared to the non-meditating um, control subjects and also enhanced the DHEA, that is dihydroethene uh, aldosterone levels. This is a metabolite of uh, uh, androgen, the male uh, sex hormones. You can see that this uh, DHEA uh, is, uh, uh, is enhanced uh, both like day, uh, morning level as well as uh, evening level, uh, DHEA is enhanced as well as melatonin. And these, uh, these hormones, uh, uh, both DHEA as well as uh, melatonin, are very important for, uh, uh, for proper sleep organization, proper sleep quality as well as uh, proper restorative sleep. And these uh, uh, hormone levels have shown a positive interaction with the uh, entry sleep stage. Entry sleep stage is a restorative sleep stage. So that means for you to have a proper res restorative sleep, you need to have various, these hormones should be functional. And these uh, hormones are, uh, I mean, the meditation practices enhance these hormone levels. Both the DHEA, we have uh, observed both the DHEA as well as melatonin levels. And uh, also, if you look at these, the functions, the varied functions, apart from the sleep organization, DHEA as well as uh, melatonin levels are very important. Uh, they have got various psychophysiological attributes, like uh, it reduces anxiety, improve coping skills, enhance positive mood, enhance overall quality of life. So you see that we have this yoga practices and hence the release of many hormones. It is not only DHEA or melatonin, many hormones like uh, very various neurotransmitters like uh, serotonin, dopamine, encephalins. So all these are feel, we call it as feel good hormones because they likes to, they help to establish a very highly deep relaxation state with reduced anxiety. Uh, uh, enhance the positive mood in that definitely enhance the uh, uh, improve the coping skills and enhance overall quality of life and thus uh, help to establish well-being. That is why we say that these are all feel-good hormones. Uh, so up to almost 19, like from 1925, uh, these research studies have been initiated and up to 1960s, nobody has thought about studying the influence of yoga or meditation on brain functions. It was in 1960s, BK, Professor B.K. Anand and his colleagues from All India Institute of Mental, uh, um, Medical Sciences, Ames, New Delhi, they have initiated studies, they have recorded the EEG uh, from a yogi, and they have observed, they have observed that uh, these yoga practices enhances certain wave patterns, like you can see that, and we call it as, these are all eight to 12 heads, uh, alpha waves. So, uh, and these alpha waves, especially in 60s and all, we knew that only alpha is an indication of relaxation. So when these yogic practices, um, uh, I mean, the practice of yoga influence uh, the brain functions and that helps in um, uh, enhancement of alpha waves and alpha is an indication of uh, relaxation. Usually alpha waves occurs when you are in a um, eyes closed. When you just sit, uh, eyes closed, relax the state. You can we can pick up alpha from your occipital uh, brain areas. Whereas in meditation, you can see that it is not only from the occipital region, but throughout the brain regions, you can study the uh, this alpha wave pattern. So this is one of the observation they have observed. I mean, they have published in 1961, and later. Um, uh, it was um, established, I mean, it was um, uh, subs uh, subsequently it was found in, uh, I mean, reported by other uh, scientists like uh, Robert Keith Wallace and Fred Travis. They are all, they all belong to the TM group, that is a transcendental meditation. If you look at the literature, you can see that 
transcendental meditation studies uh, have been uh, are there in the literature from 1970s actually they predominated it is uh, they are the maharshi maharshi makesh yogi's group and they predominated uh, uh, the scientific studies on meditation and they have observed that so but still again you can see that it was an indian who has in, introduced this uh, uh, who has uh, published this first study on the influence of yoga on brain functions and this was substantiated then subsequently by uh, tm group uh, from mahesh mahesh yogi and they have also observed uh, enhanced alpha and theta power and uh, enhanced synchrony and coherence so when there is a synchronous of activity across brain regions we call it as there is enhanced synchrony and enhanced synchrony later i will be talking about that later that enhanced synchrony indicates something else so when you observe because in 70s and 60s we didn't have much sophisticated uh, methodological tools to identify to understand the brain uh, functions or to understand the effect of yoga uh, so uh, but with the existing tools they could uh, study that and they could come up with the hypothesis that this enhances uh, i mean uh, as meditation practices enhance uh, brain synchrony um, they have anticipated that this synchron uh, this um, synchrony is is an indication of a brain integration so when the whole brain is integrated uh, uh, through meditation practices one definitely will be less stressed and more effective and happier so you see that this itself just record brain uh, brain activity from a meditator and look at the brain synchrony if there is brain synchrony you can just uh, um uh, uh, show that it is uh, the brain is more integrated and uh, uh, that leads to happiness it is nothing but happiness and less stress and so this itself uh, enhances the positive effect this in itself reduces uh, your negative effect like fear anxiety depression and you become more and more positive more and more happy and um, that leads to uh, quality life and uh, enhanced well being and he is professor t deshraj it is professor t deshraj who has introduced uh, uh, who has established the department of neurophysiology at nimhans we are all trained under him and uh, he has uh, also initiated uh, his research studies on understanding the neural correlates of uh, meditation as well as neural correlates of uh, uh, consciousness uh, since uh, uh, since 1980s uh, 1980s so we were all trained under him even dr shelly tellis uh, he she is uh, now at present in a, a very well known neurophysiologist and a, a yoga new, uh, i mean uh, yoga practitioner and a yoga scientist uh, from padanjali's um, uh, institute uh, at haridwar and uh, in addition to this uh, brain activities the just uh, eeg uh, that is an indication of brain activity she has also conducted uh, along with deshraju this um, uh, she has worked with professor deshraju she is also trained under dr deshraju then uh, slow, uh, she moved afterwards she moved to yasyasa and now with the padanjali institute so they have initiated studies to see the cognitive potentials so these cognitive potentials uh, can be recorded with uh, uh, very specific averaging technique they can be just isolated from the background the eeg and we can study the wave various wave patterns she has looked into the middle latency potentials these middle latency potentials are uh, below 200 millisecond the potentials arising in the brain before reaching to the cortex so these are all uh, potentials these are all um, brain activities that is happening uh, uh, sub, at a subcortical level and they have observed that uh, the, these uh, pranayama technique or even meditation on om chanting can influence these kind of uh, brain activities especially the thalamocortical activities uh, and uh, these are indications that uh, uh, this uh, uh, mental i mean these various techniques like yoga or meditation practices can influence various uh, brain potentials so these are the major studies we can say that up to 2000 these are the major studies that have been carried out um, or i mean to understand the science of yoga and they have observed that these yogic practices can bring alterations of these biological functions like autonomic function brain functions hormone immune functions cardiovascular functions um, hpa axis and uh, axis regulation and so on so you see that how 
or yogic practices uh, uh, can influence these biological uh, functions uh, and that we can measure objectively and uh, that can be correlated with our bio, uh, the uh, behavioral outcomes that yoga practices uh, promote relaxation and it bring positive effects reduces anxiety stress and improves coping coping skills and overall well being so here you can see that <clears throat> so anybody who uh, who start to practicing yoga or practicing meditation very diligently uh, within 3 to 6 months we can expect these results actually and most of the meditators i would say that they stop at this level but now suppose if you study now if you continue your meditation meditative way of life or if you continue the yogic way of life for life long so on long term practitioners what happens you can study but you know like so these were the questions after 2000 uh, uh, scientists have started asking these questions like see for example when i said that in uh, uh, um, bhagavad gita expounds that uh, yogic practices uh, helps to achieve various mental virtues like solemn bearing and broken joy benign meditation deep discrimination and definitely that to help uh, the spiritual upliftment of humanity so how these are happening how you are achieving uh, all these uh, virtual virtues so for that you have to have you have to there should be lot of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, changes that is happening in your brain and there will be totally uh, total inside out the transformation that is happening in the properties of the brain network and that these proper these changes definitely will be making the brain more resilient then only you can achieve that your brain is a compassionate brain or an altruistic brain you can so uh, these long term practices help uh, to achieve psychological efficacy that is um, enhance self regulation emotion regulation enhance physical self efficacy as well as uh, bring a proper mind body awareness that is enhances mindfulness enhances attention concentration self and social awareness now so that means you have to have Uh, uh, very brilliant techniques in your hand uh, to study to look into these uh, aspects of um, functions of yoga uh, on and directly on body and brain and definitely there is a there occurs a paradigm shift in our um, uh, in our understanding on uh, brain functions with the introduction of uh, uh, various uh, methodological tools and uh, conceptual ideas so there should be appropriate conceptualization of uh, your study as well as uh, the development of various methodological tools thus uh, we have got this brain mapping techniques that is uh, uh, with the introduction of various imaging studies like uh, structural and functional mri pet scans and eeg studies eeg studies are definitely very important for localization of activities in any brain region and uh, um, Uh, these uh, um, imaging studies uh, help us uh, to understand the brain function connectivity analysis that is functionally integrated uh, relationship between um, uh, uh, between areas that is separated uh, uh, across brain regions so you see that uh, uh, you can just uh, with this technique you can study the functional connectivity between any areas of the brain and then you can also study the localized uh, areas i mean details of using eeg so a combination of e, uh, a combination of imaging with eeg technique definitely will help us to understand various aspects of network efficiency as well as brain resilience and with this technique definitely we will be able to understand various aspects of brain functions for example i will just give you these are all the studies from our own um, uh, lab you can see that Uh, uh these are the just eeg we have recorded from senior meditations and teachers of vipassana meditation and you look at the highly synchronized wave pattern across brain region we have used a 124 channel eeg uh, system so that mean across all 124 areas of the brain they have they are showing highly synchronized brain waves there are such synchronized brain waves we have not seen among novice meditators so that means these are achieved through uh, meditation practice and what they, what that this indicates definitely this high synchrony is an indication of highly highly integrated brain that means the entire brain is uh, connected with each other 
so highly synchronized brain is an indication of highly integrated brain and also we have the technique to differentiate this uh, eeg wave pattern according to the uh, frequency of the waves so frequency waves so once you uh, dissociate the eeg into different frequency waves and then you see the functionality of uh, these waves what this what does these mean like so they can differentiate they can they can bring high differentiation as well as integration of the brain of so information processing will be taken place very efficiently so that is what it meant so you have to have high integration as well as high differentiation capabilities this uh, new newer technique and you see that meditation practices uh, helps uh, enhance the synchronized oscillations like you can study the theta gamma oscillations alpha gamma oscillation alpha theta gamma oscillation almost all having different uh, Uh, cognitive processes and thus these uh, these brain oscillations so study on these brain oscillation definitely provide you an understanding of unified cognitive uh, operations and that is very important for understanding the neural basis of consciousness for example we have looked into while meditating while the meditation practitioners are while they are during meditation we have observed there is enhanced alpha alpha at around 8 to 10 hertz and this enhanced alpha is an indication of sustained attention and awareness positive emotion feeling of happiness and bliss uh, and also there is a dissociation of self that is also enhanced alpha is an indication alpha gating we call it as alpha gating is an indication that uh, <clears throat> there is a self uh, dif- uh, referential processing there is a reduced sense of self and you are there is an enhanced internalized attention Uh, to uh, while during meditate while you are uh, uh, meditating okay we are practicing meditation and also we have observed enhanced with theta during metta bhavana so this is these are all we have conducted in uh, medica- uh, in vipassana meditation practitioners and the meditation practitioners so the enhanced alpha during uh, anapana as well as uh, during vipassana meditation both are associated with enhanced awareness and enhanced attention and concentration there is a theta this is a kind of it is state of loving kindness you are just sharing positive you are generating positive attitude to yourself as well as to others and this is thus enhanced theta is an indication of enhancement of purposeful attention engagement and mental patience and emotion regulation so you see that all these now we are able to study all these through the various brain mapping techniques and thus this so once we know more about this brain integration and uh, uh, tononi has come up with an uh, hypothesis of integrated information on uh, uh, theory of consciousness that is in the integrated information is a function of the brain network complexity and uh, integrated information is associated with the level of consciousness or content of consciousness so uh, uh, so this integration as well as the synchrony as well as differentiation is very important and meditation practices uh, help to enhance this integration and the differentiation um, in many meditation um, traditions we have also looked at the enhanced brain connectivity analysis we have done with each brain waves like this is about uh, alpha hmm. yeah this is about alpha enhanced or enhanced theta no no this is about alpha so uh, we have seen this um, uh, uh, alpha wave connectivity enhanced alpha wave connectivity among the meditation among vipassana meditation practitioners so that means meditation practices uh, uh, how meditation practices enhance mental clarity it is because of the enhanced connectivity they can uh, process this information in a better way and thus it can uh, it can lead to mental clarity and hence intellect cognition cultivation of higher virtues and wholesome behaviors so all these now you see that we are getting more and more information on the neural correlates of these behaviors now let us see that what uh, uh, what this mean so this is uh, in one of the important study like sahaja yoga meditation practices this has been um, uh, published in uh, 2001 by aptanas and gorkisin and uh, sahaja marg meditation um, it is a focused in general uh, meditation and it uh, lead to emotionally positive blissful experiences so this uh, uh, this enhances the internalized attention and also come up with a positive blissful experience 
And this blissful state is accompanied with enhanced anterior frontal and midline theta synchrony. So there, there is a generation of anterior frontal and midline theta synchrony as well as enhanced long distance theta synchrony. You see that uh, this um, uh, theta synchrony connect to the brain areas, uh, which are situated apart. One is in the frontal region, one is in the uh, uh, posterior region of the brain. So it is, this is uh, theta synchrony, connect these, connect these uh, areas, various brain areas. And in each brain areas, you can see the sameness of activity of theta. So th these are all indications of highly integration, you know, integrated brain associated with the meditation practices. These are also, they have shown only among the long-term meditation practitioners, because these are all will take time. This, uh, uh, even though meditation induces various plasticity events, for uh, integration, it takes long time, uh, maybe more than 10,000 hours of meditation practice is required for uh, this kind of uh, highly integrated brain associated with the enhanced the long distance theta synchrony. So thus, they have, this study has shown that emotional experience is positively correlated with the theta and the internalized attention is correlated with the theta alpha. You see that you can dissociate various behaviors and uh, the associated uh, neural uh, substrates. This is another example, very interesting example. This, uh, this has been studied by Welton and college. They have carried out a, a lot of studies. They have contributed a lot of our understanding on the Vipassana meditation. And in this case, they have looked at the evoked the event related potential. I have told you that uh, about the Shelly Telly's studies. That is, uh, these are all cognitive event related potentials. You can study these by using various very brilliant technology. Like say, for example, you can use some auditory oddball paradigm. You are presenting the subject with the various auditory tones of standard tone of maybe 500 Hertz. These will be um, presented to the um, subject very regular at very regular intervals. Whereas oddball paradigm, you are presenting a very different tone of maybe 1000 Hertz so that you can distinguish this tone from that of this tone. And these are randomly presented. So that means the meditator should be very attentive to, uh, uh, to recognize this oddball tone. And also, in addition to that, they are also presented with a distractor you know, white noise. Now, uh, they have carried out two different um, studies. One is the meditators are asked to carry out this task. That is, when they see, they hear only the oddball task they have to press a button. Uh, in that case, they have observed and enhanced the P300 waves. P300 waves is a cognitive potential associated with enhanced attention and cognition. And in, um, in long-term meditators, they could also dissociate these wave pattern like P300A as well as P300B. That is P300A and P300B indication of uh, uh, attention and memory processes. So meditators showed a distinction when they are carrying out a cognitive task. Whereas now when these, these meditators are asked to carry out a meditation practice, so when they are practicing meditation and when these um, auditory oddball, I mean these uh, auditory tones are presented to them, they have the ability to disengage these unwanted signals uh, from, the, from their meditation practice. So they, they were able to continue their meditation practice, ignoring these, uh, uh, these uh, auditory tones, whether it is standard oddball or distracted. See, whereas in the control uh, uh, subjects, they are non-meditating subjects, they were, uh, while, you know, uh, they were given a task of uh, concentrating on the breath. But even while concentrating on the breath, they were able to uh, give attention to these uh, uh, distractor sound or oddball sound. And thus, uh, they have, uh, we have, I mean, you know, the study showed enhanced the gamma activity in the control, whereas reduced activity in the meditation practitioners when they are practicing meditation. So you see that they have the capability to dissociate the unwanted thoughts, unwanted stimuli, irrelevant to attention and cognition uh, demanding stimuli, that is while practicing meditation. So these kind of mental discrimination is possible only when you are carrying out various, you know, very proficiently these meditation uh, practices for more than 10,000 hours. And also these are all um, MRI studies to show that uh, they also, this kind of ardent meditation induces various structural plasticity. It is not only the functional plasticity, what we have seen in terms of P300 
or in terms of um, uh, various dissociation of, uh, uh, I mean, synchrony and coherence in terms, I mean, that indicate the brain integration. Now, structurally also we see that there are enhanced cortical thickness in various areas associated with it. In various areas like right prefrontal cortex, insula, right insula, anterior insula is associated with the interoception. Interoception is subjective feeling uh, uh, from the body and emotional awareness. So body awareness, insula is very important and also performance monitoring, conflict resolution and so on. Uh, right prefrontal cortex is very important for executive functions. So you see that uh, these um, meditation practices enhances areas associated with cognition and uh, various uh, body awareness. It is not that there is an indiscriminate enhancement of uh, cortical thickness. It is only those areas associated with various specific uh, uh, cognition. And also studies have shown stress reduction correlates with structural changes in amygdala. That is, these meditation practices reduces um, amygdala uh, activity uh, even during emotional processing. So you see that yeah, amygdala is associated with the emotional processing and emotional regulation and highly stressful to sensitive, uh, stressful, uh, highly sensitive to stressful events. And meditation definitely re leads to stress reduction and thus you can see changes in amygdala activity. And you also should correlate you now, parallel thinking also should be there. See, for example, this reduced amygdala activity during sleep is very important. That is, uh, it, uh, uh, if there is an enhancement of amygdala during sleep, especially during REM sleep, and you know that REM sleep is associated with the dreams, and the enhanced amygdala activity during REM sleep uh, lead to uh, uh, enhanced, uh, you know, dreaming of negative dreams. You will be, uh, you will be dreaming of various terror uh, scenes, sequences, and so on. So all negative dreams are associated with enhanced amygdala activity during REM sleep, whereas meditation uh, uh, practices definitely reduces all these amygdala activity and it also enhances um, uh, the sleep organization. In our studies, we have observed enhanced the REM sleep state as well as enhanced the restorative sleep among meditation practitioners. So you see that there are many, many studies to show that Enhance the, uh, enhance the cortical thickness and uh, uh, enhance the brain connectivity in long-term meditation practitioners. Definitely brain connectivity enhances uh, the brain integrity and also processing of various information. And also um, uh, information processing also will be faster. So these are all the, some of the uh, studies. And also I wanted to bring into your notice that most of our studies, uh, brain imaging studies uh, have helped us to understand uh, uh, the various uh, functional uh, consequences. Like see, for example, uh, most of these studies, and I, I wanted to bring two things here. Most of the studies have been carried out using Buddhist meditation. Um, and most of the studies have been carried out uh, in Western countries. So the contributions of uh, using the brain mapping studies are all from the West and using mainly using the um, um, Buddhist meditation practices. Uh, so that is uh, one thing you have to, we have to really uh, give credit to this. Uh, and also brain imaging techniques uh, help us to understand the various qualities of the brain. See, for example, if you study our nature, by nature, our brain is a cognitive brain and an emotional brain. So by nature, your brain is cognitive brain and an emotional brain, and that helps. This is very important for, you know, I mean, for the very survival as well as uh, adaptation to environment. Whereas now, when Gita says that, you know, like uh, your brain, you can attain virtues, like you can be a compassionate brain, you can, uh, you can become an altruistic uh, individual and so on. So how that is possible? So that means these are possible. That means you can now generate a compassionate brain out of an uh, emotional brain, or you can generate a, a loving kindness brain out of an emotional brain. So these are all possible that this meditation technique induces various, you know, these are all examples of experience dependent plasticity. So meditation induces various plastic changes in the brain property, in the network property, and that enhances the network efficiency and the efficiency of brain regions associated with the various higher mental virtues like compassion, uh, like um, uh, generosity, altruism, and so on. 
So this is one of that paper, like regulation of neural circuitry of emotion by compassion meditation, effective meditation practices. Meditative practices foster altruistic behavior. It helps in cultivation of positive emotion, empathy, compassion, together with enhanced activation of insula and various limbic areas. So these studies have shown us uh, that the areas associated with this higher uh, virtues. Insula is one of the area and other areas include uh, anterior cingulate virus and other limbic areas, uh, limbic areas and the enhanced loving kindness when joy of others is perceived. So you see that when you are, when you are involved in various uh, wisdom based meditation techniques, like loving kindness that enhances joy of others with, uh, you know, when the joy of others is per perceived, you are becoming more and more compassionate and you are, you are only having that uh, loving, you know, like uh, you are, uh, you are happy when the joy of others is perceived and the compassionate brain, you are compassionate, you are, you know, like, uh, especially the uh, anterior insula is activated means compassion when the suffering of others is perceived. So you see that you are showing various empathy uh, and these, these brain areas are there in your brain, but uh, these are all activated only through meditation techniques, meditation uh, processes. And uh, here I have told you that it is the brain, uh, uh, brain uh, studies. It is mainly the brain imaging studies helped us to understand uh, uh, or Buddhist meditation practices help us uh, to understand all these things. Now, Buddhist meditation practices itself, if you take, you can see that, uh, uh, see, one of the core uh, understanding of the Buddhist meditation is that uh, Buddhist meditation tradition uh, practices mindfulness meditation. And that is practiced as a basic meditation tenet to attain equanimity, sati, that is mindfulness, samadhi, concentration, samadha, tranquility, and vipassana which are important prerequisite to attain wholesome state of mind. So any Buddhist meditation you take, they start with a mindfulness meditation practice. And that mindfulness meditation practice is very important to attain equanimity and other properties like sadhi, samadha, um, samadhi, vipassana, and so on. But still, as per the Buddhist meditation tradition and teaching, uh, the mindfulness meditation alone will not help the meditators to explore the innermost nature of the mind, which is free from suffering and stress. So that means you have various layers of your mind. Uh, through med uh, mindfulness meditation, you may be able to touch the various superficial aspects of mental functions. Whereas to study the pure nature of the mind, you need to probe into more details, more into various wisdom-based meditation techniques like compassion, um, uh, loving kindness, or even emptiness meditation. So that depends upon uh, the meditator, uh, which uh, uh, wisdom-based meditation technique to be chosen. Um, for example, emptiness meditation is considered as, uh, you know, very, very few meditators are there in the world who practices the doctrine of emptiness. That is, emptiness means emptiness of all phenomena, including the phenomenon of self. And it is that state you can you can perceive the ultimate peace in the mind and the, i mean buddhist according to buddhist philosophy uh, this state is compared with nirvana or attainment of enlightenment so now um, uh, this is an opportunity for the neuroscientists to study these aspects now what is the neural correlates of emptiness meditation now we have the tool in our hand we can design an experiment and look at these meditation practices one of the study is uh, uh, published in Frontiers in Physio I mean, Psychology, content-free awareness, e.g. fMRI uh, correlates of consciousness and as such in an expert meditator. So this is a report from an, a single meditator who have got more than 50,000 hours of meditation practice. And they have observed that there is a combination of, so this study itself is a combination of high resolution EEG and fMRI and they uh, look at the dynamic aspects of uh, both uh, connectivity as well as uh, uh, localized activity, e.g. power analysis. And they have observed there is a neural correlate of uh, content free awareness is associated with a sharp decrease in alpha power and an increase in theta power as well as an increase in functional connectivity between DIF, that is a dorsal attention network, and a decrease in the posterior BMS, that is a, a dorsomedial I mean, um, default mode network. 
So there is a default mode network, as you know, that is associated with the self-associated, you know, mind wandering or self-associated um, uh, processes. Whereas when there is a dissolution of self, uh, they have observed a decrease in the posterior DMN activity. So you see that with this kind of uh, various technology, we are now in a position to understand the substrate, neural substrate of mind, as well as definitely we can also, uh, you know, extrapolate to understand the consciousness. A neural concession, a neural correlates of a non-dual awareness in meditation. You see that we are now studying various aspects of awareness itself. And you know that neuroscientists uh, try to understand consciousness because they consider consciousness is uh, something that is um, uh, uh, the self-experience or the self-awareness. And we are studying the neural correlates of self-experience or self-awareness. It is totally different from that of the uh, concept that is from uh, from philosophical perspective. In philosophy, you consider that um, consciousness is uh, ever pervading the um, the blissful state of or the blissful atman that is non-physical entity. Whereas here, uh, neuroscientists try to study this through a physical entity, like through the neural correlates. But here also, we we wanted to study, we wanted to look at integrate these concepts of consciousness from different perspectives. Like now uh, with these kind of uh, technologies and with these kind of approaches, we are in a better position to understand the neural correlates of mind and also neural correlates of uh, consciousness to certain extent. But um, we are yet to study various aspects of mind, various aspects of consciousness that I will come in my, uh, in my next few sli uh, slides. And in addition, see, for example, I wanted to ask you whether the, our consciousness can be hijacked. This is a story of the Walt Disney movie, um, you know, the Pied Piper, the children of Hamlin followed the Pied Piper, uh, which is uh, enchanted by his uh, flute, uh, playing the flute. So that means uh, it, this is an indication, this is an indirectly telling that your brain can be, your brain function can be synchronized with his brain function. That means, there is a synchrony between, it is not only synchrony within the brain function, it is between brains. How do you study this? It is very interesting. For example, this is one study, very interesting study, interbrain synchronization in the practice of Tibetan monastic debate. You know that Tibetan monastic debate is itself is, an, uh, is um, a kind of uh, uh, meditation um, practice. That is, uh, Like these practices they do uh, mainly with different purposes. So this is this itself, this monastic debate itself is a meditation practice. And they do this to enhance their concentration and also to improve the emotional resilience in daily life situations. So they can achieve many things through this kind of uh, monastic debates. So in this case, you see that one is, uh, one is considered as a challenger who is standing and the other is a de defender. And the challenger can pose many questions uh, and uh, interact with the defender. And that it is the duty of the defender to provide proper answers uh, to the challenger. Yeah, so this monastic debate goes on. And this study has been carried out uh, by Netherlands, uh, Don uh, Mariki Van Gogh. So uh, Mariki's study is very interesting to show that they have, she has showed an interbrain alpha synchronization across brain. You know, when there is agreement among the challenger and the defender. And when there is, when both are uh, very uh, uh, senior meditators. So you see that you can now look at meditation, you get uh, your consciousness from different uh, perspective. Uh, so, uh, and I, we are, I mean, you know, I am just bringing your attention here. I'm not, come, I mean, talking anything about the meditation here. So here, uh, I just wanted to see that the advancement, the, now we have many, uh, this artificial intelligence based machine learning uh, uh, programs available to look at uh, various uh, brain patterns uh, and look at the um, uh, integrity of the brain network. And these brain patterns help us now to study, to, uh, to see the level of consciousness. People have come up with the perturbation complexity index um, and various other scales of consciousness. Now you can measure consciousness uh, with this scale at the, during wakefulness, during sleep, 
and also during different stages of unconsciousness like you know this uh, un unresponsive wakefulness syndrome locked in syndrome and so on so you see that now we are you know neuroscientists are also able to uh, understand the level of consciousness or come up with a uh, consciousness meter which can, which can measure the level of consciousness or content of consciousness in varied uh, uh, unconscious situations so now definitely applying these definitely we can think of studying the meditators there is one study came in nature communication quantifying uh, arousal and awareness in altered state of consciousness uh, using interpretable machine learning and they have come up with a, like a perturbation consciousness index so they have also come up with an explainable consciousness index using various patterns of uh, eeg uh, network activity and they were able to study uh, various uh, you know the level of consciousness in ketamine induced anesthesia as well as in rapid eye movement sleep so you see that now scientists are coming up with new newer concepts and newer methodological approaches to study consciousness from the from the perspective of neuroscience so that means now i uh, i wanted to tell that so it is possible now it is you know like whatever expounded in religious text that you can achieve all these uh, virtues through meditation practice and because we have many many techniques in hand and that help us uh, to achieve these um, uh, virtues and understand the biological the neural correlates of uh, these virtues but the thing is the challenges there are many many challenges ahead there. again for example now these uh, these studies most of the studies as i have mentioned it's all come from the buddhist meditation studies but india has got very many traditions of meditation practices like say for example vipassana meditation various buddhist wisdom based meditation practices uh, brahma kumari satya yoga meditation isha meditation um, uh, sudarshana kriya yoga sudarshana uh, simplified kundalini yoga there are many 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 varied meditation techniques and this uh, each meditation tradition has their own very specific meditation techniques say for example brahma kumari's meditation raja yoga meditation they there is a kind of contemplative meditation focusing their attention eyes closed meditation eyes open meditation focusing their attention on a symbol of om whereas vipassana meditation is totally different focusing on the breath breath awareness so there are different techniques each tradition has their own different technique and they uh, and thus they can impact the brain in different ways they can bring different neuroplastic effect on the brain they can produce a different a distinct psychological experience and thus you see that thus we can study the varied human experiences uh, using different meditation tradition and thus uh, you know so that is showing that these are all challenges ahead of us uh, to look at the neural correlates of uh, meditation i think i will stop here um, and we can take up some i mean some question answer thank you so much for giving me this opportunity thank you dr madmai madmai are you there Hello. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Hi, Mark Dev Datta. It's a nice. I am oh, here okay. listening. Yeah. Yeah. Academic. Yeah. yeah. He is just coming. Please. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here he is. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was listening, and he is our new faculty, or not? Okay. So it's uh, really very interesting. So a lot of new aspects are coming out. So my point is, so we are actually looking at. Okay, that's fine. That uh, uh, my question is. the different types of basically the buddhist meditations they are increasing the uh, network plasticity um. communications between but can we know any kind of uh, from this uh, window that aspect that any kind of molecular basis behind this oh definitely yeah. that i can see as a neuroscientist i have just projected only the uh, you know the neural correlates yeah actually see for example after 20th there are lot of uh, molecular genetics studies have come up uh, you know we can look at various aspects uh, from right from the dna rna anything like uh, whatever you are interested you can see because many studies have only looked at the telomere length and telomerase activity 
and there are studies to show that this telomere and uh, length is, you know, uh, can be uh, increased or telomerase activity can be increased uh, associated with meditation practice. But definitely, you know, this the whole, uh, you know, uh, it's a it's a new whole world is open up in front of us. Uh, you know, with the various technique, definitely you can molecular definitely. I didn't bring all this because I thought uh, I see uh, this. I am confident to give you this. Uh, this talk. Whereas, if I have to look into uh, the other molecular aspects, uh, definitely I will have to do a lot of uh, preparation. So, uh, you know. Yeah, because now the point is coming. Uh, okay, because the, uh, our uh, research, this aspect has evolved a lot more. Because starting from uh, uh, from uh, Professor Desi Raju when he was here, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. because just from the initial, uh, just uh, looking at the alpha levels and uh, the alpha synchrony, then we went on through our more more uh, technological improvement. We got this different kind of EG. We are getting the EG sources. We are keeping on analyzing the different network plasticities. We have fMRI with us. So whatever aspects from the meditative point of view, one thing is clear, that it is increasing the network connectivity and the synchrony. Now, I mean, uh, it would be very interesting from our aspect that what drives this network synchrony? Are we in a world of perturbations and we are just learning how to uh, just uh, minimize or pacify these perturbations are around us? Because these sensory bombardments or the sensory wars Definitely, it is, pro I mean, providing enrichment at one time, but sometimes we have to look out inside ourselves and whether this inside looking has something to do with the change in the molecular aspects that is driving the uh, network plasticity or not. That yeah, see, yeah, but, uh, your spiritual being. I, 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 the answer is, uh, I mean, yet to be explored. Yeah, yes. In the see, present day world, you know, it's very challenging. Each day, each minute is challenging, actually. So, how do you take up the challenge? That is the question. See, for example, any, any strata of life, the person who can accept challenges, who can face challenges, definitely will be able to lead a successful life, you know, a peaceful life. Whereas those who are not, so that depends upon the personality. You know, see how to how do you cope up with your stress? How do you you know that coping skill? So like you you uh, do you I mean you can recollect uh, Darwin's that uh, you know the survival of the fittest. Where, but uh, you know here he mentioned that it is not survival of the fittest. He meant that it is not the stronger or not the weaker. The pe the the person who can adapt to changes you know they can be you know they are the survey you know they can survive okay so you see that the survival of fittest actually it is your adaptation capability that is very important how do you adapt to your challenges how do you face how do you overcome your challenges these are all very important so otherwise definitely you will see now see for example even if you take the students fraternity you know Earlier, I don't know, our time and all, uh, we never heard of uh, mental health issues, you know, among students. Whereas now you look at, uh, there are a lot of students having mental health issues. True. Why? Why that is? That's a question mark. You know, why? So that means we have to uh, really uh, rewire all our program, I mean, you know, education system. There are, we have to approach our life in a different way, I feel. Uh, so if you approach, so then uh, definitely this is one of the best way, you know, yogic way. Yogic way of life, we are not telling that you have to really become a yogi. We can adapt that life in our day-to-day -day life, uh, that attitude in our day-to-day -day life. Definitely, and that should start from our house. See, domestic violence, you can reduce the domestic violence. See, today's paper, you know, I, I am sure you would have read or you would have heard the news. The son, you know, like shot uh, the mother dead and kept the dead body, you know, and it was uh, the, the, the sting was coming and then only he has informed. So that is a state of affairs, whether it is in a household or in the society, you know, uh, these are all quite a dangerous um, uh, this things. We should though really think about, when we think about this NEP, we have to really give more weighted to these aspects. 
you know, when we think of NEP or bringing new resolu I mean, a resolution to the education, we have to bring up to all these and think about, see, for example, these are all the negative side we are talking now. Just imagine the positive side. Even you have all qualities in you. Only thing is, you do an internal journey, as you said, then. And that helps you to, you know, uh, to manifest your inner virtues. So these kind of education, if you give to the students, definitely, I feel that, uh, you know, we can make a very good, uh, very, you know, uh, uh, good uh, human beings. We can make them at least a good human beings. You know, that is what is, uh, I don't know, this kind of discussion we have to have with uh, uh, some policy makers. You know? So one thing is very clear that, that is today's life is taking a toll on our, I mean, uh, network plasticity, that network connectivity, the connections, that is the outer world, the stress, and this kind of uh, morphed sensory enrichment we are getting out sometimes, which is uh, with our changing society. Yeah, and with the advancement of technology, you see, for example, the, yeah. uh, you know, your mobile phone is enough now for you to know everything, no? Yeah. And then you get addicted to addiction, drug addiction, or uh, video addiction, whatever it is, you know. Because, yeah, definitely, it's challenging. So, these feelings. Yes. There should be some kind of uh, restriction you have to bring in our mo mobile usage, everything. There should be some, we have to have a strict regimen in our life. Like, you know, one hour, okay, you look into your uh, all these uh, social media and whatever it is. The rest of the uh, 23 hours, utilize it for your own, you know, upliftment. That should be the attitude of life. It's a, it's a nice man. Yeah. Any questions? Or no? Nice meeting you, Arvind. <laughs> sure. A long time we are meeting. <laughs> yeah, all this meeting. Yes. Yeah. It was actually a very nice way. Very nice. Thank you. This is recorded now, uh, Dr. Padmai. Yes, yes. We, we are uh, live streaming in YouTube as well as recording. We'll send you the. Recording. Yeah. Yeah, and just send me so that uh, I can keep it. If any, you know, any students or anybody wants to listen, they can. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. So we formally close the session today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. I really enjoyed meeting you all online. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> <laughs>